So, where are we at at the start of 2024? We're six days in. Six of the 366 are already done and dusted. I heard somebody, I saw somebody post, so far, my success rate in surviving difficult days has been 100%. I'm still here. <laughs> uh, for some of us, uh, where are we at, 2024? Some of us feel like same old, same old. It's like we haven't got out of 2023 yet. It's just the same thing that keeps. Some of us feel that way. Others feel, yay, 366 awesome days. 366, yeah, this year's a leap year, right? Yeah, a bonus load shedding day. What an incredible <laughs> opportunity, yeah. <laughs> Others have vision for 2024 because your year has started differently. There's a new love in my life. Mm, of course, your year is going to look different. Roses are red, violets are blue. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's not go there. Okay, good. <clears throat> Who got married in the December period, the Christmas Eve? Who got married? Who's now for the first time, you're entering this place as a married couple? Nobody here? Eish, we're going to work on this, aren't we? All right. <laughs> Who of you gave birth to a new baby in this period, the December season? No new babies here. Well, yeah, I'm assuming it's kind of early to be in church. <laughs> right. So let's not. New job. Who's starting a new job this year? Awesome. Awesome. Great. Looking forward to great things. Yeah, some of us haven't been back to the office yet since last year. The Lord alone knows what's waiting for us. Uh, some of us moving into a new house in the next few weeks. Hey, right, something to look forward to. There are pros and cons. Those of you who have moved house will tell you. Uh, enjoy. And, all right. So where are we? I, I think this kind of conversation probably is like AD 30 in our timeline, looking way back. Maybe in Israel, Jerusalem, in that area, they were also asking, so what's new this year? I mean, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. AD 30, you know more or less where, where things were in Israel at that time. Some people thinking because of the Romans and the, you know all of their puppet leaders, everything is just becoming dismantled and destroyed. Everything that God helped us to build up over generations is like slipping through our fingers. It's, it's no longer able to sustain our communities and our lives. I mean, there was a flicker of hope. Some people could remember 30 years back, there was like this star and like, you know, these people who came from the East and said, the king is born. It's a new era that has opened up. What happened to that child? Oh, Herod destroyed all the babies that were born at that. So our hope died with him. But those of you who've read the story know that's not exactly what happened. That may appear to have happened, but the truth, stranger than fiction. Now, AD 30, what we have is, oh, there's revival. John the Baptist, this guy with, with camel hair coat and chewing on locusts and wild honey is coming, and man, is he preaching up a storm. He's getting people to be baptized. Repent, 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 I say. Ah, oh, okay, okay. And, and, and man, there seems to be a spiritual revival, and then John gets put in prison, and suddenly the revival shuts down. No, no. One of the guys that John baptized He's now evidently taken over from John. He's now preaching up a storm. His name is Yeshua, Jesus, the carpenter of, carpenter's son, comes from Nazareth. Man, has this guy got stuff to share. You want to hear what he has to say. There's hope. The way he teaches, the way he preaches, the way he touches people's lives, it's as if hope has suddenly come alive. If you were living in that season, that's probably where your head would be at. But fortunately, you're not living in that season. You're living in a better season. You're living in the aftermath of the cross. You're living in the breaking open of resurrection life and the infilling of the Holy Spirit empowering you to walk and live in the kingdom of God. This is where you're living. You have been set up beyond where they thought they were being taken. 
Jesus comes and he begins to preach and we have in Matthew 4, 17 and in Mark 1, 15, some of the comments that Jesus is making. He says, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's literally within your grasp. Don't miss it. Why he would say repent, we'll talk about that in a moment. The other thing he says, repent and believe the gospel. He's making an appeal to your awareness that the kingdom is a reality and it's within your grasp. And he's making an appeal on your faith to trust the truth of the gospel. Do you know what the gospel is? Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment or two. What is the gospel? What's this gospel of the kingdom of heaven? What is this all about? I think setting up a conversation to understand why Jesus said the things he said, we need to just dig in this morning on three key concepts, okay? And we'll go there in a moment or two. In Matthew's gospel, of course, every one of the gospel writers give you a short prologue and they introduce you to the characters and the key role players, and then they start with an initial first story which sets up your understanding of everything else that this Jesus is going to say and do, all right? Mark, Mark's gospel was the first one that was written, so in that sense, uh, there's really not much of a prologue. There's not much of a setup because most of the people who were alive when Mark's gospel was written and published, most of the people already had in living memory, they knew the setup. They knew who Jesus was. They knew where he came from. They didn't need the backstory. Most of them were Peter's disciples the disciples of Jesus, most of them could understand when Mark started telling the story, they already had the backdrop. So they didn't need a big prologue. But when Luke comes along and Mark, when Matthew writes and Luke writes and John writes, suddenly there is a generation of people who are not first generation witnesses. Now they are second generation, first generation believers from those who were first generation witnesses. And so there's a bit more of a backstory setting up who Jesus is and what he came to do and say. So in that sense, we have the setup, and obviously we know from Luke and Matthew how that Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit. He comes and he begins to preach. He begins to break open the realities of the kingdom of God. He says, repent and believe the gospel. Repent for the kingdom of God is here. Some, Matthew talks consistently of the kingdom of heaven, and Luke talks consistently of the kingdom of God, uh, whereas Mark and John very often just refer to the kingdom, because it's truly the only kingdom worth mentioning. All of the others have come and gone. The leaders of the then world, Brutus and Caesar, um, somehow those names have either gotten lost Or they have now become, you know, the names we give our pit bull or our Alsatian or, you know. That's the legacy of Brutus and Caesar and those guys who ruled the world. But the name of Jesus has somehow continued to exist and be honored and venerated through all the centuries ever since. So when Jesus arrives, he begins to talk about the kingdom. He introduces us in Matthew's gospel to the kingdom of God. He tells us we need to believe the gospel, and he tells us we need to repent. So I'm going to take just those three concepts this morning and talk you through what this kingdom is all about, what it means to repent, and what is the gospel. Having done that, next week we're going to start diving into Matthew 5, those first few verses, what are the things that Jesus said are the things that are fundamental to being part of the kingdom of God from next week on? Okay, so those of you who came for that this week, you're welcome to get up and leave now. (laughs) For those of you who are too polite to get up and leave, I'm sorry. Now you're going to have to listen to the rest of the stuff that I had in mind. Okay. Let's talk about the gospel first. What is the gospel? We have four records, eyewitness records, of the life and death of Jesus and the implications of what he taught 
We have four records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let me take you through those four. Let's start at the latest one, the oldest, uh, the, uh, the one that for us is like the closest to where we are. And let's work back from there. John's gospel, uh, as I said, he sets the stage as a launch pad. He uses the wedding at Cana in Galilee. I love the way John's gospel parallels Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 is the story of light and darkness being separated from each other and life entering in and coming to create something that is new, redefining what it means to exist, what it means to live. Genesis 1, John 1 comes in and brings Jesus in as the word that God spoke in creating all of this. It was he who is the energy behind what has been created. So, John 1 and then John 2. Genesis 2, we get the story of man and woman. You see, Genesis 1, this is why God created. Genesis 2, this is how God created. So we see man and woman. And Genesis 2 ends up with this wedding. Man, isn't it awesome? So John also starts off with the wedding. Isn't it amazing? Why would God want the gospel to start out with the concept of a wedding. Because it's like a man, life is joy and it's all, you know, weddings are awesome celebration opportunities. Yeah, yeah, true sometimes. <laughs> I think, follow my reasoning here. If ever you wanted to know why God created man, created you, I think let's go back to Genesis 2. You get the second half of a conversation in Genesis 2, verse 18, where God says, looking at the man that he created, and remember, Genesis 1 closes off with a comment that everything that God created was so good, God couldn't improve on it. It was absolutely amazing. For those of you who are bothered that my voice doesn't sound the way it weeks, so today is my first choice, first opportunity to use this voice. It's going to get better in the next three weeks, okay, so just bear with me. It's nothing that the sound guys are doing, it's really not their fault. Let's give them an, a round of applause for the work that they're doing, just to make us audible and be able to enjoy. Okay, so in Genesis two, we have this conversation where God looks at the man and he says, it's not good that this man should be alone. Understand, he's not dissatisfied with what he has done, because he just said in Genesis one, it's so good. The man included, so good. But he says it's not good that he should be alone. Now, alone doesn't mean I oh, see his talk shape. He hasn't got the mic. Let's, you know, oh, come on. Somebody can help him. Bursuka fro, whatever. No, guys, help this man. No, that's not where this conversation is going. You need to see the first half of that conversation in Genesis 1, where God the Father looks at Christ the Son and he says, I am so satisfied with who you are, but I don't want you to be the only one of your kind. I am so satisfied with who you are, my son. I want more of you. I want you to have someone of your kind, a helper that is suited to you. It's not good that you should be alone. So we don't hear the first part of the conversation in heaven. We hear from the second part on. So God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him rule. Let him have dominion over all that we are creating. So this repeats itself in Genesis 2. When God looks at the man, Adam, and he says, you are too good to be the only one of your kind. I want more of your kind. So to have more of your kind, I'm going to make you a helper who is suited to you. And together, you are going to be fruitful and multiply. And you are going to fill the earth with more of your kind. This is the conversation that's happening. This is what a wedding is all about. This is the, every wedding is the prophetic statement that what God said about this man, he said about Christ, this man represents Christ. And he shouldn't be the only one of his kind. God wants more of his kind because God wants more of the Jesus kind. 
So every man who gets married is stepping into the fulfillment of that anointing or that calling or that mandate over him. Make more of your kind. Assuming, of course, that you have become of the God kind, that you are of the Christ kind, so that more of your kind will fill this world with more of his kind. That's what marriage is supposed to be and do. So John's gospel starts there, telling us this is why Jesus came. Oh, thank you so much, Rob. Appreciate that. This is why Jesus came, so that he, through fellowship with us, could produce more of his kind. His mission, he says in John 1.18, is to reveal the Father, to come and draw people into intimacy and relationship with Him so that people get to discover who the Father is through Jesus, His representative. You see, when it comes to intimacy, when it comes to uh, being one with Him, the discovery that I've made is that Jesus did not come to set me free to do my own thing. Jesus came to set me free so that I could become his. He, so, he told me that to my face. I didn't come to set you free. I came to make you mine. You think being free and doing your own thing is the highest good. I know it isn't. Being free to be mine is taking you to the highest good. He says that in John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you are going nowhere. Without me, your life will never fulfill its potential. When God creates different environments, Genesis 1, earth, sea, sky, then he speaks into that environment and brings forth living creatures. Speaks to the earth, bring forth animals, trees, plants. Speaks to the waters, the sea, bring forth fish. Speaks to the air, bring forth birds. Why? He speaks into the environment in which that living creature would find its fullest potential and live to the fullest of its extent. So where does God speak into when he wants to create man? God speaks to himself. Let us make man in our image. The environment from which man comes, God, that environment is the environment in which man will find himself fully satisfied. When I am fully satisfied with him, he is fully glorified in me. Okay, so the knock-on implication of this is, where does God go when he wants to create a woman? Ponder that. We won't pursue that rabbit trail now. You see, in intimacy with him, everything that he is and has becomes ours. There's an inheritance. There's power. There's authority. There is provision. There is the end of loneliness. There is the fulfillment of everything you were created to be in Him. Outside of Him, you're going to be missing so much. You see, marriage, <laughs> I remember the day I decided the woman I'm now married to, oh, strangely enough, yeah. 10th of December, 1983, that was the day that we said, I do. Do the math. I'm not good at math. <laughs> I remember the day I decided this is the woman I want to marry. And the conviction that I arrived at was, my life doesn't make sense unless she's part of it. I remember that. And that's what I communicated to her. I said, will you be my wife? Because this life will not make sense if you are not part of it. Fortunately, she already had a word from the Lord saying that this is where this thing is heading. So when I popped the question, she could respond with a, okay, let's do this. <laughs> and we've been working at it ever since. <laughs> you see, 
the other thing that Jesus is saying by inviting us in this wedding image that he's creating in John 2 is you will never find fulfillment of what you were created to be outside of relationship with me. If a woman wants to become a mother, she needs to be intimate with a man. I know science and uh, all sorts of genetics have taken us to different places, but up until literally a few years ago, that was the way it worked. She would never fulfill her calling as a mother outside of an intimate relationship with a man. Family, we become part of God's family. We become one of his kind. John kicks off the whole conversation on what this kingdom is all about and what the gospel is offering us with this picture of the wedding. And from there on, that whole conversation on intimacy, John takes us chapter for chapter for chapter until we discover the fullness of what God had in mind by including us in a life of intimacy with a king. This is John's gospel. It's an invitation to be included in a life of intimacy with a king. I've taken a lot of time on John's gospel. Luke's gospel, obviously Luke sets up the whole thing and he starts with Jesus' hometown first sermon. Local church, he's been on the road, he's been to John, he's been baptized, been anointed with the Holy Spirit. He's coming back home, and at home, he gets to local church, and this is his first opportunity as a traveling rabbi to share the word in his own church. So they give him the, 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 the book roll, the scripture, he opens it up, he reads from Isaiah 61, and he says, this is what I have come for. The kingdom of God is an invitation through Jesus in Isaiah 61, to a life that is restored, a life of quality, a life of significance, a life of impact. This is where Luke's gospel is taking us. You are invited, you are included in this life. Where Mark's gospel takes us, obviously, Mark really starts with the first order of business. Jesus needs a team. So he's walking along the beach and he's calling guys, you want to be part of my team? You want to, Simon, Peter, whatever. So Jesus starts this whole, Mark starts the whole thing of Jesus and the team. We have a mandate. We have a mission. We have this purpose here. We are going to tell the world about the kingdom of God. Are you going to join me? We're going to do this together, right? Yeah. So that's where Mark's gospel starts. And from there on out, it's the team telling the world. God's kingdom has broken through. And then, of course, Matthew's gospel, where we're going to be going from next week onwards, starts with Jesus' first campaign. I mean, he's, he's gathering hundreds, in fact, thousands of people to listen to him. As he draws them together, he begins to share what the kingdom of God is like. It's a life of favor, a life of glorious Favor. He starts every one of those. Um, have I missed one? Yes. <laughs> the, in the Gospel of Mark, a life of authority. In the Gospel of Matthew, a life of favor. Every one of the Beatitudes, Jesus begins with a statement, You are blessed. And then the other stuff follows. When this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, whatever. You are blessed. That's the foundation from which this kingdom functions. When you step into the kingdom, you step into the favor of God. And you are included in this kingdom. If you want to know where kingdom comes from, I, I, I guess it's kind of, man, the, the whole, um, this whole thing of um, democracy, et cetera, et cetera. It's been kind of, yeah, but we don't know kingdoms anymore. You heard in the news that the Queen of Denmark has stepped down and her son is now being the King of Denmark. You, a couple of years back, Charles became the King of England. So, yeah, we do have kingdoms, but I mean, they're like, you know. But in Jesus' day, kingdom was a vital reality. Everybody lived in a kingdom. There were no such things as democracies. <laughs> uh, you, you get to vote for the king, tough. <laughs> you get the king, whether you vote for him or not. Uh, it's not a democratic system. Uh, it's not a totalitarian system either. The kingdom of God is different. You see, the kingdoms of this world, top dog, that's who you were, and you got to say, and everybody did what you said. So God, God is all 
powerful. He can do that. But he chooses not to. He chose to create you with the capacity to choose, to respond. Somebody once explained it to me this way. Love can never be love unless you choose to respond to love expressed. If you are forced into responding, then it's not really love. It's a violation of your will when you are forced to respond to somebody. True love is a desire to respond from the heart to who they are, who he is, who it is. This is the, fun, this is the foundation of the kingdom. You choose, you respond. Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven. The rest of the gospels talk about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a reference to the king himself, the one who, is, who has authority. And the kingdom of heaven is the place from which that authority is being exercised. It's beyond the limits of an earthly kingdom. There are no geographical limits. There are no financial limits. There are no racial limits. Uh, limits, exclusion, inclusion, nothing of the kind because the seat of this kingdom is in heaven. It's, it's over all races, nations, economies, whatever. It supersedes every one of those. Now in Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus comes and he claims to be the king of the kingdom of heaven. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. For those of you who follow Asterix, you will remember Asterix and the chieftain's shield opens with that first panel that is so reminiscent of Psalm 47 verse 9. Psalm 47 verse 9, the shields of the earth belong to our God. In that opening panel of Asterix and Caesar's, no, Asterix and the chieftain's shield, you have Vercingetorix the conquered chief of Gaul, laying his shield down at the feet of Caesar, the Roman conqueror. This was a common occurrence in the time of Jesus. What would happen when a Roman army moved into a specific territory, the Roman general, once the army had mopped everything and everyone up, the Roman general would then take up a significant place and all of the conquered chieftains would come and lay their shields down at the feet of the conquering general. When they had done that, the, the general would stand up and say, all authority in, and then he would name the territories that he had conquered, all authority in these territories has been given to me. I have all authority here. This is what Jesus is saying in Matthew 28 verse 18. All authority has been given to me. And then he mentions in heaven, and in earth, there are some manuscript traditions that include and under the earth. And I, I'm inclined to accept that could be true. Um, in fact, I believe it is. If Colossians 2.15 is anything to go by, he stripped principalities and powers of their sham authority, ruling over them in the cross. So he is, if Matthew 28 verse 18 is true, then everything else Jesus says has implications on us. If Matthew 20, 18 is not true, Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me. If it's not true, you know the logical implication of that, right? So let's find out what else Jesus said that is not true. And once you go there, you might just as well accept that most of what he said is not true, so why bother? So if Matthew 28, 18 is not true, are you seated in the wrong company this morning? Uh, because here's a bunch of people who do accept that Matthew 28, 18 is true. That he is the ruler. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He is the one who has all authority. You're seated in that company this morning. And if that is true, then everything else that Jesus had to say has implications. In Matthew 5, he opens up his conversation on what it's like to live in his kingdom. He starts with, you're blessed. And then he mentions a whole bunch of things. In spite of this, in spite of that, in spite of the other, you're blessed. And if in this world you're experiencing these things, just remember, in the kingdom, 
This is how we see that. We'll go into those details next week. We won't go there now. The gospel of the kingdom. Let's land this with a comment or two on what it means to repent. Obviously, the word that is used there is the concept, the word, Greek word metanoia, meta, the whole, uh, you, we know meta in terms of, not Facebook, but in terms of biology, uh, metamorphosis, the transformation of a caterpillar into a moth, that's the meta that is include, that is at the root of this word metanoia, meta noose mind, it's a transformation of the way you think. You see, when Jesus steps onto the stage and says, repent and believe the gospel, he's saying, you need to change the way you think about God. Because God is looking at you and saying, you are blessed. Whereas I'm looking at my life and saying, God, where are you? Why is my life going? Yeah. But he's saying, hey, from where I'm looking, you are blessed. Yeah, we can go through a whole bunch of conversations on how blessed you truly are. If you had a roof over your head last night, if you went to bed having eaten something last night, if you got here using your own transport this morning, the fact that we are in a building where there are lights, <laughs> you know, cameras, etc. never mind, lights, sound, camera, whatever, all of this, you belong to a niche group in the world's population, probably a 5%. You're in the top 5% of the world's population. So this morning, the Father is looking at you and saying, you are blessed. And you're looking at your life and saying, oh Lord, no, it's not working out. It's not, it's not the way I want it. Okay. So change the way you think about your life and get your thinking into alignment with the kingdom of God. You see, I'm challenged every day with the difference between my experience and the reality of life. You see, I experience the sun rising every morning and setting every evening. That's my experience. The sun is moving. That's my experience. But the reality is, it's not the sun that's moving. It's me. I'm standing somewhere and the, where I'm standing is moving. And the fact that I'm standing on a moving object is creating the impression that the sun is moving. In fact, the sun is probably the most stable thing in our solar system. This is what the kingdom of God is like. You may be standing somewhere on a moving object, a merry-go-round that the kingdoms of this world have put you on financially, emotionally, socially, or whatever. And you, you know, God, what's happening to my life? but he is stable, he is consistent, he's not moving. He's the one that is the reference. You, know, you need to start thinking the way he thinks. You need to start seeing what he is seeing. You need to repent. You need to embrace the kingdom, the vision of the kingdom of God. You need to embrace the values of the kingdom of God. And you need to embrace the processes that God has set up to work in the kingdom. Let's land with this part of the conversation. Gerdy, you're welcome to, if you want to move back behind the piano. If you're not going to embrace the processes that he has set up to work, remember Matthew 20, 20, Matthew 22, round about verse 29, when they come to Jesus and they ask him questions about marriage and divorce and stuff like that, he says, you guys... You're going wrong. Your argument is starting from the wrong place and you're moving in the wrong direction because you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Now that power of God, um, a lot of people take that to mean this charismatic thing where the anointing comes and man, it's just like, whoa, the power is here. That's not what Jesus is referring to. Uh, it could include that. And I'm sure he wants you to experience some of those things. But what he means is the way God has set things up to work, the empowering processes of the kingdom. You don't understand 
you're thinking from a certain place and you're coming to certain conclusions because you have not bought into the empowering processes that God has set in place in the kingdom. Marriage is one of them. Parenting is another one and so on and so on. Sowing, tithing, investing in the kingdom is another one. Those are the processes that God has set up And when we engage with those processes according to the way He wants them to run, guess what happens? Our lives benefit from engaging in those processes. One comment. Remember Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, Jesus is not putting the bar there and saying, okay, guys, only the high achievers, right? Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me, let's see. Let's see who's going to make it. That's not what the conversation is about. He's actually saying, unless you are prepared to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. He's not saying you don't qualify. What he's saying is that you are making it impossible for him to disciple you when you are in charge. You're making it impossible for him to disciple you when you insist on remaining in charge. He cannot disciple you. You cannot become his disciple unless you prepare to put him in charge and say, okay, I will deny myself. I will take up the cross that you took up. I will fully identify myself with your death, burial, and resurrection, and I will follow you, your word, becomes the foundation from which I reason about my life and the things that I expect in this world. And in case you were wondering, that's good news. That's good news. I have spoken to too many people who through ignoring the Lordship of Jesus Christ have found themselves in the most disruptive places. Their lives have become dismantled, ineffective, totally destroyed. That's what Proverbs 28, 19 tells us, where there's no vision, no redemptive redemptive revelation from God. People perish. You start dismantling yourself from the inside. Unless you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him, you cannot be his disciple. Let's wrap up with Psalm 84. Look at this. You are blessed. How blessed all those in whom you live. Okay, this is like the starting point for being blessed. Invite him to live in you. That's the starting point, to be blessed. You're blessed because he lives in you. And your life has become a road that he is now traveling. Guess who's behind the steering wheel? No longer you. He's behind the wheel. He's determining the direction. He's taking you places. Yeah, a lot of us, I mean, most of us who can drive and who are married or take people with us who also can drive, you know that tension, don't you? You are thinking in a certain way and you're driving and the person next to you is seeing what you're seeing, but they're interpreting what you're seeing differently. And they're telling you, look out for this, stop, why so, hang on, no, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Most of us know that kind of, I think sometimes Jesus being in the driving seat doesn't appreciate our comments telling him, but you're not thinking, you're not, wait, watch, whoa, where are you going? I don't think he appreciates that kind of commentary. I think he would love to explain to us why he's doing what he's doing and where he's going with your life. Your life has become a road that he is traveling and that's what makes your life so blessed. Yeah, truly, they do wind through some lonesome valleys. They'll come upon brooks, discover cool springs and pools that nobody else knows about, brimming with rain. God traveled these roads, curve up the mountain, and at the last turn, Zion, God in full view. This is where he's taking you. 
at the start of this year, I'm going to invite you. And I realize some of you have already done this and some of you have done this time and time again. But I'm going to invite you to make this declaration again together. To embrace His Lordship over our lives. And to accept His indwelling presence so that our lives can truly be roads that He is traveling. So right there where you're sitting, just bow your head. And if you want to close your eyes, you're welcome. I'm going to lead in with a prayer and I'm going to invite you to audibly respond and follow as I lead in this prayer. If you don't want to, if you feel that's against your principles, that's okay. I'm not telling you you have to. I'm just inviting you if you want to. So let's begin by saying, Lord Jesus, I confess that you are Lord. If all authority is yours, then I am under your authority. I confess my dependence on you. I turn my back on self-made plans. I embrace the principles of the kingdom. I step into the life of the kingdom of God that you have designed for me. Thank you that you have a vision for my life that far surpasses anything that I can imagine. Thank you that you are good and because you are good, I am blessed. Thank you that you are a giver. And because you are a giver, I have received all that I need. In Jesus' name. 